episode of Surviving the Survivor, we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, SGS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor. They seem to never end, which is a good thing. They go on and on and on, and uh, I guess it is uh, unfortunate because that means that a uh, crime in this country uh, specifically seems to have no end. I guess it is uh, as old as time itself. But today, um, a truly historic day, and I know uh, we said that we are going to bring you Sebastian Rogers, uh, the missing 15-year-old with autism out of Tennessee. Uh, we're going to have that show on Thursday now at 5 p.m. Eastern, and the Geo Profiler is definitely joining us. I reached out to him and apologized for switching things around. Uh, but this is a precedent-setting case. And, of course, uh, tomorrow is opening statements in the Chad Daybell trial. So we're going to have that for you live on our best channels, uh, on our best trials channel uh, you see it there, Surviving the Survivor Trials. That will be all day tomorrow. And then we will uh, do a special show tomorrow night uh, with some players involved in that case specifically. And then, again, Thursday, Sebastian Rogers. Uh, before we get into this show, and uh, you now see our third guest. He's looking dapper and great. Uh, we'll get to him in a moment. Um, but just want uh, to give a very special shout out to Space Coast on the West Coast. Uh, he gets up very early uh, the last two days, did some early morning shows, uh, not to mention our amazing mods. And I, I never mention them just out of fear that I will forget one, but you know who you are. And uh, I know I know who you are. I'm just always afraid of leaving one out. There we go. She knows I'm a dumb dumb, the COE. Frankie Figs, I'm not T-Pain, Gen X Granny. Copper Horse, Shaquille Oatmeal, perhaps the best name in all of the YouTubes and the interwebs. And of course, it goes without saying the COE. And um, if I am being completely transparent and completely honest, uh, this is a lot harder than it looks. It takes a tremendous amount of coordination. A lot of people supporting us like the mods, uh, and they do it for pennies on the dollar. Um, and I wish I could pay them millions and maybe one day we will get there, but, uh, we are far from there right now. Uh, just a lot of planning, a lot of coordination. Of course, Steve Cohen is, uh, they volunteer. Yes, they do. Um, that's why I said pennies on the dollar. Um, and Steve Cohen, of course, who helps us book. So, um, the best way to support us honestly is to tell a friend about the show. Give us five stars on, uh, the audio platforms, uh, which are very important to us. And if you want to help, uh, Patreon is a way to support the channel. I was listening to NPR today, and uh, they're you know they're always asking for support. They're a, a member-run station, um, but it is it is a tremendous amount of work, and I don't want to sound like I'm whining and complaining, but I just want you to know uh, what goes on behind the scenes. And uh, the COE and I are keeping the ship righted and hoping that you guys are enjoying the programming. So, uh, without further ado, a quick rundown. Uh, this does not have to be sort of a, a typical show. Um, look at this. The own, my own wife, move on, enough whining. That's not whining. I was just uh, speaking some truth right there. Um, <laughs> best guests going uh, clockwise here. We've got Tim Jansen, famed Tallahassee criminal defense attorney, does all the criminal defense stuff, the, uh, the fancy schmancy stuff. He was also a federal prosecutor. Then uh, you've got Brother Counsel. He's got his own YouTube channel. Uh, a lawyer in the Detroit area, very smart. He's also been commenting on uh, the Adelson uh, case, of course, involving Dan Markell. Uh, I am still in the home studio as my boxer, Ethel, tries to break in, and no one does anything to help, uh, but we will allow Ethel to walk on in here. And, of course, last but not least, this is the first time ever we have a best guest coming to you from – Literally, the COE is chasing Fred Roosevelt, Mor Morris Roosevelt Brown. I got his name wrong. I'm so uh, turned around here. Um, complete chaos as we try to get the main studio back up and running. But Daryl Cohen, for the very first time, we have a best guest joining us from Turks and Caicos. The question is, why would he do it? Daryl, what is the answer to that? Why would you ever come on the show while in Turks and Caicos? Because... My friends do things for me, and I do things for my friends, and because I'm very concerned with what happened today in the sentencing. I uh, love to hear that, and uh, I do consider you a friend now, and uh, 
through this show and uh, love to have you on and really appreciate it. And the picture sounds good and it looks good. Uh, so we love that. Um, I just want to take a moment. The COE is going to load in these uh, photos to uh, mention the victims in this case of this Oakland Park shooting. Kate Meir, 16 years old. Hannah St. Juliana, there they are, uh, 14. Uh, we'll go in the order here. So Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Beer, Justin Schilling, and Matt Baldwin. And we heard from the families today. Uh, just devastating. Um, any death is devastating when they're old, but when it's kids not even close to their prime in life, just innocent high school kids being gunned down, it is beyond horrific. And you saw the pain. Uh, in the families and their faces uh, today. Tim Jansen, your reaction to this? They received the maximum sentence. This is a precedent-setting case here where two parents were convicted on involuntary manslaughter charges, four for each of the deaths, and they are now going to spend 10 to 15 years in state prison as a result. Well, I think it it, it is a historical moment in our criminal justice and legal system. Um, people are trying, are crying out to stop the shootings. And you see, this is just finally a microcosm of the other parents who done nothing and the kids are giving symptoms and signs. But have we reached to the point now that we're going to punish um, parents? Now this, this child didn't hide it very well. And I think part of the reasons why the parents were charged well, because of their behavior at the school, buying the gun, lying about it, uh, giving him the gun at 15, going to the school, saying, are we done here? Um, we're, we're not taking him. He's going to have to walk home. Those don't show any good parenting. And I think when you heighten the fact that four young people were killed by a troubled child, the school brought the parents in. The parents had some involvement with buying the gun for him and not properly storing it. So it, it reached all a crescendo effect against these parents. But what about other parents who don't have these signs, who don't do the things, have the opportunity to do the things that were mistaken or not done in this case? Are they going to be charged? Are we going to give prosecutors now full range to go after parents if they don't like the crime that's committed? Um, the, the, the lawyers for the uh, individuals didn't do any favors uh, at the sentencing and the behavior of their clients in court, especially the husband. I mean, flipping birds to the prosecutors during the trial, threatening the prosecutor in jail calls. None of that helped. But we are in a in a new age where parents can be held responsible. Uh, well said, Tim. Um, brother counsel was with me all morning for the better part of four hours as we watched this sentencing hearing. It was long. It was drawn out. There was a lot of arguments. And then, of course, we heard the victim impact statements that were incredibly powerful. Um, Brother Counsel, your reaction to what Tim just said? I mean, how do we know where to draw the line? I happened to hear an interview on NPR with Karen McDonald um, right after this year. She she's already doing kind of the media rounds. And she said that prosecutors have incredible power and she hopes that they use that power. Uh, your thoughts on this? Well, uh, Tim is absolutely right. Like I, we spoke about earlier, it, it certainly opens the door. Yeah. Can you hear me all right, Joel? Yeah, it dropped down a little bit, but it's coming back. So uh, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to make sure so, that there we go. Better. Oh so, yeah. So I mean, it absolutely opens the door for all these prosecutions now. Uh, but what's interesting is that Karen McDonald did give an interview, uh, not an interview, a press conference after the verdict, and part of what her message was to the jury, and part of what her message was to the general public is that, no, this is not just going to now happen every other Monday. This was a specific case with egregious facts, gross negligence, uh, a lot of evidence of it. And this doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to go crazy now about where their kids are at all times and, and what do they have access to. And she, she tried to kind of play down that whole Tim Jansen uh, concern. But the reality uh, is, and I know it's one of Dan Rashbaum's favorite words, but the reality is, is that it does open the door. And now that the door is open, mm -hmm. prosecutors have that much more power. So absolutely. Uh, by the way, I knew I would get this from Tammy Morgan. NPR is an agenda, not a platform. Uh, you might be right. You might be wrong. But uh, 
So is Fox News. I listen to them all. I watch them all. I flip around. I watch CNN. I worked at most of them. And uh, the truth of it is, uh, just to digress for one moment, mainstream media is not what it once was. Uh, so you can say that about NPR, but then you've got to say it about uh, Fox News as well. You've got to say it about CNN. They used to be in the middle. They are no longer there. MSNBC. So uh, I guess it's pick your poison, but um, I also read a lot. Uh, but NPR certainly is not the my go-to. It's one of many pl places and things that I listen to. Um, Daryl Cohen from Rosemary Romero. Did the families get justice today is the question. Should the Crumblies have gotten a harsher sentence, Daryl? That's question number one for you. My first answer is I am very troubled by this. I was troubled that the parents initially were not charged. I was delighted that they were charged. I was happier even that they asked for and received a trial. Thereby, they were convicted by a jury of their peers. Having said that, I believe that this sentence is excessive based upon the facts and circumstances of the parents. They were held accountable, and they should have been held accountable. But I believe a sentence of this nature is basically what I would call cruel and unusual punishment. And I still have my prosecutor hat on as I have my defense lawyer hat on. Um, and, and just to couple that, Daryl, I mean, all joking aside, we didn't know you were on vacation. You're on vacation and you say, you know, this is a very important story for you. You wanted to comment it, on it. Why is it so important to you? It's important because finally, Parents who should have been paying attention, parents who should have been watching their child, parents who should have been guiding their child are being held accountable when they knew what was going on. And based upon the facts and circumstances of the case in chief, the main case against their son, it was obvious that they did nothing to prevent this horrendous murder. And because of that, they were convicted, they were charged, they were convicted, and now they've been sentenced. My issue is I believe the sentencing, in spite of the parents' actions, was excessive based on where we are. But I am glad that finally the prosecutors have opened their arms and have another something that they can do when parents don't pay attention. Just maybe, just maybe this will prevent another mass murder in this country from a teenager or from anyone because people need to say something when they see something. Uh, well said about that. And uh, Karen McDonald, look, she says, and I've got a quote that I'll, I'll read from her. Uh, she is not done. She says, she says, if this happens in the state of Michigan, uh, in her jurisdiction, she will go after them. Uh, Frankie figs here, uh, an amazing, um, mod and a person who helps us out here a lawyer stated it was not um and, and brother counsel i'll throw this one to you a lawyer stated it was not a significant verdict sentence because it is not precedent setting until an appellate court decision is this true there's been discussion about this whether it is precedent setting or not your uh take on this particular twist well when you talk about precedent and uh, tim will appreciate this there's I guess different definitions of precedent. There's precedent in terms of uh, laws that are case law that has come down from the higher courts, which the lower courts are bound to follow. <laughs> and then there's precedent in terms of this is the first time that something like this was done. So this is the first time that something like this was done. So that certainly is precedent and it certainly opens the door. Does it have binding uh, legal authority now? No. So that's how I would approach the answer to that question. I guess Tim can correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to Tim in one second, but this is a Michigan-specific question here from Rosemary Romero, uh, brother. Why does Michigan courts use a scorecard for sentencing? Do all the courts in the U.S. use this scoring system? I've never heard of this scorecard used in any other case that I've ever watched. Well, I can only tell you about Michigan. <laughs> so Michigan <laughs> does have – uh, PO, PRVs versus the OVs, and in order to determine the guidelines, there is some sort of points. And I guess Tim can talk to that question also if that's what happens in Florida. Yeah, 
Tim, do they use a scorecard in uh, in Florida like they did today? Yeah, we have a uniform sentencing guidelines, and it goes by the the level of the offense, and then you add in uh, prior criminal history, gives the court a range. Um, but but I I think the the question earlier is it precedent setting? It's precedent setting in the fact that it's the first time parents have been responsible for criminal actions of their children. Now, in Florida, we do have, if you have firearms and you don't secure them safely, you could be charged if they get the gun and they kill themselves or shoot somebody. So that is one crime that we do have. Uh, parents can be responsible. Uh, I think you can also have a parent could be responsible if they let an underage child drink and drive and someone is killed and they know that. Um, but this is really an appellate court will make a decision. An appellate court's going to make a decision whether the sentence, it's going to be an appeal, whether the sentencing was overly harsh. The guidelines recommended seven years. So you have to assume the Michigan guidelines, and these are recommendations, they did it properly. The parents have no criminal history. Why did the judge go above the guidelines? And, and should they, she doubled the guidelines, right? Hmm. Uh, the maximum could have been 15 years per uh, child that was killed right? Four counts. So it could have got 60 years. But the guideline is really the floor that the court should look at if you have these. Um, we didn't used to have these in federal court. And you were getting you were getting sentencing that were so disparate that you had. And there's a sentencing guidelines in federal court now. So the person in Seattle and a person in Florida should get the same sentence based on the same conduct, same criminal history. So uh, I think an appellate court's going to look strongly at this. I'm not familiar with the Michigan appellate court and the Michigan Supreme Court. I think the federal court might get involved in this. Also, could be some constitutional issues. Hmm. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see this, uh, what how it plays out. And some people are saying this case could run itself all the way up to uh, SCOTUS, the Supreme Court. We'll see. Uh, that'd be a long time coming, I think. But uh, Fun and Funky, a new name, which I love to see uh, in the chat. I'm British, so I'm biased. I do think the negligent parents should be held accountable. And by the way, this show, I'd really like to open up to STS Nation. Since this is a very unusual case, we covered the whole uh, sentencing hearing this morning. So if you have questions, please put in the uh, triple Qs here. Uh, there's another comment here, Daryl Cohen, saying that... Uh, the judge had already made up her mind before the statements <laughs> outrageous. What is the process for a judge uh, during sentencing time? Do they almost always have the sentencing already figured out in their head prior to hearing all these statements? I think we can say that's a definite maybe. So the judges obviously have watched the conduct of the defendants during the trial. Judges like juries watch body language. They watch facial expressions. They watch when someone flips you're number one, AKA a bird. So when the judge realizes that the parent or the parents have not paid attention, are not acting in a manner consistent with the way they should act, I'm sorry, I can't believe this happened. I should have looked after my son. I should have paid more attention. When parents don't do that, and this again, case numero uno, case number one, the judge is setting a message to the world that we are not going to sit idly by when a parent or parents actually help their child commit a horrendous crime. And in many ways, the parents, in my view, did help their child. Mr. Ethan Crumbling. A uh, special shout out to Mariam who comes to us from Nigeria. Not a lot of shows can say that they've got a following in Nigeria, but thank you. Uh, Mariam for supporting us there. Um, very cool for us here in the United States to see that. From Annie K, this is going back to Brother Council. We'll work our way back the other way now. How likely, speaking of appeals, is it that appeals will reduce their sentences? And then someone asked, what kind of arguments could they potentially use in an appellate process? All right. Well, uh, my short answer would be it's not likely at all. Uh, in order to re a sentence, uh, you have to show that the court abused its discretion, and you have to show that it was unreasonable for the judge to uh, to sentence what she did. And she was very careful about making a very clear record why she's deviating 
from the guidelines. And uh, I, I just, I don't see it happening. I, I think that she made the record clear and an abuse of discretion is extremely high uh, to, to overcome. Um, so I guess the short answer again would be very unlikely for the sentencing to be modified in the appellate level. Mm. Uh, I see brother counsel sweating over his microphone, uh, which gives me actually um, some modicum of uh, joy. I have to say that I'm not the only one suffering through this because I, I dealt with this the other day, but i um, happy to tell you, I think what's going on, uh, brother counsel, is that it is adjusting automatically. So I think if you just leave it, I think it's picking up your level uh, because oh. it is a sure microphone. And so I think you're good. Uh, it's, it's okay. Hard. Well, I just locked it in. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, if it's, I'm it's too loud now, let me know. <laughs> uh, you and I have that in common. We sweat over audio. So, uh, by the way, Cats Attic Singapore is here and happy to be here. Happy to have you. Tim Jansen, you're one of the best criminal defense attorneys out there. We all know that. Um, one of the big issues, uh, and I looked at, at the person yelling at me about NPR. I also looked at the Detroit Free Press today. Yeah. I look at them all. I look at them. I'm a news guy at heart, so I look at everything. But the uh, Detroit Free Press made a big stink about, uh, rightly speaking, by the way, about how neither Jennifer or James ever took accountability. Um, if you had either of them as clients, would you have said, look, you've got to say, I'm sorry for this. I did have some part in this. Um and we tried to maybe stop it, something along those lines, but they just completely blew it off. You know, I, I don't know what the lawyers were thinking at sentencing. Uh, the one lawyer was talking about the appeal during sentencing, not the, the right approach. Uh, and as far as an appeal, you know, it's funny when you in, before judges, you get before a seasoned judge, those judges know enough to say on the discretionary rulings and not to say too much. Sometimes when you say too much, you can be overturned because you're basing the decision on something that's flawed. If you don't put enough in the record, then the court can say you didn't have a basis. Um, they should have been remorseful. It wouldn't hurt their appeal. They could still claim their innocence and say, we're so sorry. We apologize. It's terrible what happened. It should never happen. Uh, but they didn't do that. In fact, he uh, was flipping birds at the uh, lawyers during the trial. And he was also making threats that you're going to pay for this in phone calls saying, I hope she hears this. This is not what a judge wants to hear at sentencing. And it's not, it, that's what you call no client control whatsoever. None. And it showed in the sentencing. Uh, by the way, Miriam, um, brother counsel, do we know when they will be eligible for parole? Roughly. That was a question I just hopped off of roughly. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what 10 to 15 years means that in 10, after 10 years, they'll be eligible for parole. But it's also time served, which is something like, was it like 800, 800 days? Something days, like two and right, a half, two so years and change. So it's 10 years minus two and a half years. So it's that's that's when they'll be eligible for parole. Roughly, uh, so roughly seven and a half years. The sun is setting in uh, the Turks and the Caicos. Um, Marianne, <laughs> I apologize. <from> all... <laughs> I know, it's all good. Um, Mariam uh, from Nigeria says Jennifer sat down reading her statement without remorse, but James stood up. That's a good, um, a good, good catch on your part, because that is in fact true. I noticed that as well. James at least had, I don't know, the courtesy to stand and show that kind of deference, but just back to you, Daryl, on this same question, there just seemed to be a total lack of accountability and almost until today, a total lack of remorse. What would you have done differently if you were their uh, attorney? Does the word everything do anything for you? The <laughs> first thing I would have done is gone to the prosecutor and said, let's talk about a plea so they can show they're sorry, they're remorseful, they're sad, this is horrible. But mm -hmm. let's now say that that didn't work out. So we had a trial. I would be coaching them, kicking them if necessary, spilling a glass of water so that we have a adjournment so the jury walks out and say you have to sit up you have to look sad you have to look proper you have your body language is important your facial expressions are important and if i see your hands above the desk they're liable to get chopped off because when i represent someone they're going to do it my way or i'm not going to represent them this was a case they needed sympathy for them 
and they needed to empathize with the poor parents of these kids who were murdered. They didn't do any of that. As a lawyer, I never know what other lawyers say to other clients, but I know what I say. And if a client doesn't want to listen to me, then he or she should not have come to me. And there are other lawyers who are more than willing to take my place. So I'm very, very tough about when I represent someone, how they're going to look, how they're going to act exactly. I try to orchestrate everything in that courtroom that I could possibly orchestrate because I tell my clients, you have but one chance to make a first impression and that's a lasting impression. And everything you do is under scrutiny. There is someone or someone's from that jury always looking at you, regardless of whether you think no one's looking at you or not. So pay attention, be good, be demure, be nice, be sad. Uh, Daryl, you know, by the way, you know I want you to stay, but uh, that sun is setting and I want you to be safe. I know you're in Turks and Caicos, which is probably uh, one crime a decade there. So uh, if you have to go, we will totally understand. If you want to stick around, we will love it. Uh, you're turning into a silhouette. So it's uh, the imagery is beautiful, but uh, just all is good. Yeah, it says Daryl is now in the lunar eclipse. <laughs> He's going to miss happy hour if he stays on. Yeah, you're going to. I apologize. Out. Give me no, four no. or five minutes and I will have to go. So I do apologize. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, whenever you have to drop out, you just dip out and enjoy your uh, vacation. We appreciate you being here. Tim Jansen, um, I do this in news. You know, uh, the COE can attest to this. Uh, I can't watch any of these. I'm not going to even name channels, but I flip around yep. and I scream at the TV. I'm like, that's the worst <laughs> writing. This person's a horrible reporter. This one sounds like Anchorman. Constantly doing that. When when you watch these cases, oh, are you thinking God. to yourself, man, this attorney is weak. I could do a better job. Um, I would present it differently. I would have a different strategy. Are you are you constantly doing that? I have seen people on this show and their comments that are much more persuasive than the things I've seen in court. Uh, I don't know where these lawyers get their training. I don't know. I don't think they're getting training. Um, and it's just horrible because it's a disservice to the client. It's a disservice to our system because everybody is entitled to a, a good defense, a competent defense. These lawyers, I don't know if they were court appointed or if they were hired, but they completely dropped the ball um, at sentencing. I mean, trial was over. By being remorseful, they should have tried to cut a deal because I think there could have been a deal cut because this is like a, a precedent where it's never done before. So they could have probably worked on a much better deal. You would think maybe three or four years in prison, you know, uh, but now they're going to get 10 to 15. Um, I, it's amazing sometimes what I see in court. Objections that aren't made, clearly violating uh, motion and liminees are done. Uh, and the judges, you know, they hate it uh, and they get frustrated. Uh, so it is frustrating. And then watching Pundit come on these TV shows, clearly they don't have the trial experience uh, and they're saying things that are just opposite of what is true. Um, but then you have really good lawyers come on here and I, I listen to them like, boy, that's right on point. So you have a mix. I guess it's in any profession. You have the good, the bad and the experienced. Well said. I love that. The good, the bad. I'm going to use that from now on. I'm stealing that. Um, Dom's mom, 725, because her son's birthday is on my birthday. Uh, final question for Daryl before he completely disappears. I'm seeing the outline of his head. I'm so curious how Daryl felt like James supported his son besides buying him a gun because he really wanted one. Um, you had mentioned that, Daryl, your response. My response is because my child our child wants something doesn't mean our child gets something. You have to be a parent and then a buddy, not a buddy, not someone growing up together, but helping someone grow up. Parents need to exercise parental responsibility. And if they don't, and when they don't, things like this happen more often than they ever should. And having said that, I've got to go and I apologize very much. But I enjoyed it being with you guys, and thank you so very much. Daryl, thanks for joining us. Have a great vacation. Talk to you soon. See you, Daryl. Take care. Uh, what a mensch. The guy comes on from uh, Turks and Caicos. I would never do that. He said he would nope. do it for me because he's a friend, but I don't know if I could return that favor. What's what's going on, Tim Jansen? 
I would have had a pina colada at least in my hand while I was doing it if I was in Turk and Caicos. Um, um, Tim Jansen, one of the things here that's so interesting, um, I found bordering on ludicrous is mm -hmm. Shannon Smith, the attorney for Jennifer Crumbly, um, suggested that she be put on home confinement in her own guest house, the lawyer's guest house. Uh, would you ever offer up your guest house, Tim Jansen? And was that just absurd? I have never in 38 years of practice offered my client to live in my house. Of course, I haven't represented a relative, but even if it was a relative, unless a close relative, I wouldn't offer that. Um, that's just crazy. Um, I do know a lawyer in Tallahassee who helped put up the bond for a defendant one time, signed off on the bond, and the guy skipped town and fled. He ended up with like a million-dollar judgment that the IRS went after him. So now the Florida bar prohibits lawyers from being involved in uh, putting bond up for a client. But it's it's crazy. You know, you got to stick to the role that you're in. You're the lawyer. You're not the friend. You're the lawyer. That's why you shouldn't, you know, have a relationship with your client that's a little too much, too close. Like case we talk about all the time here in Tallahassee. When the lawyer has too close a relationship, it gets fuzzy. For them to ask for time served and live in my guest house, it's just par for the course for this legal team. Tim Jansen, this verdict was an indirect form of gun control. Now some parents will exactly. be afraid to buy and own guns. This sucks. I agree. I think that while this case, it seems like it was relevant and possibly good, I'm afraid they're going to be prosecutors in certain jurisdictions that are going to use this case to go after and, and do a gun control loose, loosey goosey. And it's going to really be bad um, because, you know, this country has turned so political and we have cases being political argued by both sides. Right. Um, so I just hate to see that. Now the parents are going to be possibly affected by political decisions by an aggressive or a progressive prosecutor. They call them. Uh, Brother Council's in a tough spot because he he lives uh, in close proximity to all these people. So he's got to be a little more careful because you can see him at the grocery store. Uh, from Katie, do you believe that Karen McDonald will use this case to advance her career ambitions? I can see her running for governor or senator after this. Uh, was this some sort of chess move, 3D chess, to advance her political career? So, <clears throat> like you said, Joel, uh, <laughs> I live here. And um, that's why I, I am much more generous when I'm talking about the defense team here. Um, you know, I, I, I can't disagree with uh, the style, uh, you know, that some people are questioning of some of the defense attorneys. Um, but, um, you know, I'm not going to disparage anybody or be too overly critical. In terms of Karen McDonald, I would say that this case to Karen McDonald is a case that she cares deeply about. I don't think she's using this uh, in, as a springboard. So um, that's how I know her. That's what I believe she, I don't think she was using this as that. Will this now, because of all the publicity and because of everything, maybe now plant seeds for her to do something? Maybe, but I'm not going to say, and I don't believe that the motive behind bringing these charges was to advance her political dreams or careers like that. So I hope I answered the question clearly. You did. You answered it like a senator or a governor, politically. <laughs> politically. Uh, it was good, though. Um, Nikki Cuds, our friend. Uh, so what does Tim think is appropriate then, Tim? Uh, appropriate as far as what? I, I don't. I look. I, wish I, I guess if you're finding, I, I think she's implying that if if this is um, the sentencing, walking, you mean? If, yeah, if this is walking a fine line, um, you know, how would you handle these cases moving forward? If there's, you know, if a, a child is complicit in a, in a horrific act, right. uh, I mean, if the child commits a horrific act, are the parents complicit in that crime? I, I don't have any problem with the facts in this case, and that the prosecutor looked at those facts and felt it was appropriate. I don't have a problem with it at all. I think the conduct of the parents was, was grossly negligent. And I think they could have stopped this from happening if they would have taken one step, buying a trigger lock, taking that kid home from school that day, 
not buying him a gun when they saw signs. Any of those actions might have saved four lives. So they kind of they helped it happen, unfortunately. And they weren't being parents. They were trying to be the friends to the parent. They should have got a mental health counseling and treatment. They didn't do that. What they do? They went and bought him a gun. The worst thing you can do. So I don't have any problem with the facts of this case. Um, I'm just concerned about other cases. And I, I don't know this prosecutor. I'm not saying she's running for office. And I don't know the lawyers in this case. And I hate to disparage them because, you know, you don't know until you're sitting in that chair. But I think the sentencing, they could have at least tried to show remorse and try to get a more lenient sentence. They had to know that this case was so exposed and, and those people coming in doing the victim impact were going to affect the judge. They should have tried to at least show some remorse uh, at the sentencing. And uh, we're going to start to get into some of the um, some of the uh, victim impact statements. Steve St. Juliana, who's Hannah, who's 14 years old, who died in the shooting, said, not speaking of the Crumblies, not once did they say, I wish I would have locked the gun up and acknowledge that they're not the victims in this. Um, so he's upset that they did not take uh, that responsibility. Bama Girl 75 here. Why isn't this, Brother Counsel, the same concept, and this is a great point, as charging a parent for buying an underage child alcohol if the child then kills someone while driving drunk? Um, why not the same sort of liability? Well, I would say that there's an argument to be made that it is the same type of liability. Uh, you know, you, it comes back to the statute, which says a parent has a duty to ensure that his child is not going to be a, a safety risk to the community. So if if you go and give your kid underage child alcohol and they know where the keys are of your car and you have reason to suspect that they may go take those keys and drive the car, absolutely. I think we're right back where Tim kind of opened up this whole conversation that we're opening up the door to all these type of situations. Mm. Uh, Holly by golly. I love seeing new names. Uh, love welcoming new people here. Raised three kids in the house with guns. Talk to your kids and listen to them. They're fascinating creatures. I like Holly even more. Mm -hmm. I would call my kids creatures as well. Uh, <laughs> Tim Jansen, you always tell me uh, the further north you go in Florida, the more southern it gets. And uh, yes. <laughs> are, are you, are you, Tim, I never asked you, are you a gun owner? Do you have guns in the home? I, I do and I am. You do and you are, you do. Yes. So yes. did you have these conversations? Um, shout out to Nightwood, by the way. Well, uh, when yeah, I had, yeah. when I had, when my kids were younger, I took every precaution in the world and I talked to the girls and they didn't like guns. They didn't like being around guns, but I did all the safety measures you have to do. Um, I'm an empty nester now, so I don't have that issue. My wife is a, a experienced with the firearm. Um, but I think it's a choice. Some people don't believe in them. Um, I like to shoot birds. Basically. I'm not a, I'm not a deer hunter but I enjoy shooting birds um, and for safety, for sure. I used to be a federal prosecutor and we were allowed to have firearms uh, for protection. Hmm. Um, Ghetto Daddy says, I got yelled at yesterday for using the term baby daddy. Um, and then the COE and I had a nine hour conversation about it um, afterwards for some unknown reason. This case was tried in a kangaroo court. People make their choices. Prosecutors now are going to charge anybody else with somebody else's crime now uh one thing this for sure did brother counsel is it's opened up a debate um the sad part about it is there's four victims here and all these families are just destroyed um you could see the pain in their faces but um i don't know is this is this a broader um debate i mean is it does this have to be you know brought up politically i'm talking at like the uh at a level, at a national level, when people are running for office, things of that nature, whether or not this kind of prosecution should be moving forward. There, there might be, and there might be a, a need for the legislators to, to get involved and create statutes um, for these types of situations where uh, parents can be held responsible. I don't, again, I, and I think that part of that question was, is this going to open up everybody to anybody else's conduct? And the answer to that is no. Here, again, there's a specific statute, at least in Michigan, maybe in Florida as well, which says that you are required to pr 
protect society against your children. So um, that's it's just literally when you have a duty, that's where this that's where culpability can come into. Um, so I don't have the duty to protect the society from my crazy neighbor. Uh, so you know, um, so it's not going to open it up in that way. But I think <laughs> seeing where this is going to go, if prosecutors start opening the door and start charging more parents, then yeah, we're going to. This is going to become a much bigger issue, which politicians are going to talk about, and which legislators may have to get involved. And yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be a little bit of a interesting um, future with this. Tim, I know you're not a psychologist, but uh, from Kim here, how did the Crumblies, all these new names, I'm loving it. How did the Crumblies show remorse since they don't think they're guilty of anything? That's a great, great point. If you're not guilty, how do you show that remorse? Well, they can show remorse by saying they're so sorry for what their child did. So sorry for what you're going through. This is a parent's worst nightmare, if only I had known. But she came in at one point and said during the trial, she wouldn't have changed anything she did. And then she tried to clarify it. Uh, that's a dumb statement. She certainly should have changed a lot of things. Shouldn't have gave him a gun. I think she lied about it too, didn't she? Lie and say, I didn't know about it. And then she yeah. was a yes. text about her saying this is too expensive. Yeah. Um, you can show remorse without waiving your appeals um, for sure. And that's been done all the time in courts. Sometimes the lawyers try to over control their client and tell them not to say anything. Or, and sometimes clients say what they want to say. You can tell them what to say, and you can look at what they're going to read and have them read it to you before sentencing. And then they get in there and they say things you're like, I wish I wasn't standing next to this person. Uh, but the person that usually you know, suffers is the client. Um, all they did was give the judge the gas that the judge had already probably decided that she was going to give a hard sentence. And it just made her feel better. Uh, it probably inflamed the victims again, the families and the media. That's what we're talking about. No, no remorse. That's all they're talking about. 10 to 15 years, they showed no remorse. Hmm. Yeah, uh, well. Tim, we're, we're kind of circling this question, so I'll toss this one back to you from WebFan. Will this case today establish a precedent for all courts nationwide? Um, will this become, uh, like I just asked Brother Counsel, uh, a national issue where other jurisdictions now are going to say, hey, uh, by the way, thankfully, it has been very quiet, which is weird to say, uh, you know, we're so used to these school shootings happening more frequently, and I don't want to jinx myself, but it has been quiet. But um, it's inevitable we're going to see another one uh, at some point. And will we now start to see people clamoring for this kind of prosecution uh, in other places? Tim. Oh, is that to me? Yes, sir. Um, I think you're going to see prosecutors now open to the idea. I think you're going to see prosecutors um, using this as a vehicle for cases that they can't prosecute. Uh, we'll see what kind of effect it has on shootings. We'll see if it has any effect on parenting, on whether parents will now lock up their guns or not leave their guns in cars unlocked. This is how they're getting stolen in Tallahassee. People will have, have guns in Tallahassee, leave them in their car, and they don't lock it. Uh, I'm not shooting parrots. I've been <laughs> reading these responses. I should have never said I shot birds. They're just quail. I would never shoot a cardinal. I'm, I'm from St. Louis. I like to shoot the baseball team because they're terrible. But I would not shoot your parrot. I love birds. Um, I just shoot quail, and I do it once a year. So I want to qualify my shooting. <laughs> um, yeah. Just just us here, by the way, says Karen is not running for governor. If you live in Michigan and are politically connected, you would know that is BS. Um, forget who asked the question. I think it was a fair question because a lot of time you do see high profile prosecutors run for political office and yeah. you just never know. But uh, just us is telling us no way when it comes uh, to this. Speaking of the judge, uh, not the prosecutor here, uh, Judge uh, Cheryl Matthews, and again, uh, brother counsel, don't want to put you in a precarious situation. I thought she handled this really well. She said, and I quote now, parenting is a complex job. Opportunity knocked over and over again, louder and louder, and was ignored. No one answered, and these two people should have answered and sure did not. Uh, pretty stern words. 
Yeah, I mean, Judge Matthews, by the way, I, I was she, she, she doesn't get so flustered. You know, sometimes you get a, a judge who will start screaming at the defendants and <laughs> and uh, getting all worked up about it. She, I, I knew that wasn't going to happen. Um, she's uh, very even kilt, uh, but um, that's basically you know right out of the prosecution's closing arguments. I mean, that was essentially what they were arguing that uh, they had all this opportunity and they ignored it. Um, the defense would probably would have liked to cut her off and say, no, they didn't have all that opportunity. They didn't know about the journal. They didn't know about all these text messages with his friends. You know, they they didn't know about uh, all of his mental health problems. But it doesn't matter. This is, you know, the, the jury already found what it found, and uh, the judge can now use that as part of the reasoning for her sentencing. And uh, and and it was what which which was clear to me, which we spoke about, is that it seemed that she already had exactly her comments printed up. She typed them up. It seems like she knew exactly what she was going to say, and she knew exactly what she was going to uh, sentence them to. And therefore, it didn't seem that anything that would have been said during sentencing would have altered that or changed it. It is possible, and I have seen judges in the past have something written up, and then because of a hearing, because some new information that they hear, they may change it on the fly. Most of the time, not. Uh, but if she would have taken a break, like I said to you, Joel, privately, if she would have taken a break and said, okay, I need to think about this and come back with a sentence, then I wouldn't be so certain that she had it already in her mind. But after all the everything that went on, she just read out her her prepared statement. So it seemed it would seem like it was a foregone conclusion what what she was going to sentence them to. Uh, better Tim than me. Damn it! From wildfire, my canary never hurt you, Tim. Uh, <laughs> followed by quails are gorgeous. <laughs> followed by quails have no meat. Tom, Tim, Tom, Tim. Followed by many birds. Uh, followed by this one from Cat Dragon. Quails are living creatures too. They Tim. are. I just want to go they on the are. record. Uh, look at this. Pam says because they're good eating. Um, I was when I was in Argentina, the farmers wanted us to kill the birds because they were eating their crops. So in Argentina, they want you to shoot them. Hmm. Uh, let me tell you something. Um, Ethel Ethel Bug Johnson is her full name. I am still recovering uh, from her murder of an iguana in my pool a few weeks ago. Um, it was one of the most horrific sights I have seen. And uh, <laughs> I had to personally take the, whatever you call that. I'm, I'm, I'm new to Florida. So a pool skimmer picked that iguana up and uh, place it in its final resting place, which is a construction lot directly across the street where a new house is going up. So that is my gift. Uh, to the neighbors, but um, watching that and experiencing that, I know I am not built for uh, for hunting. I could never hunt. Uh, I could never, ever, ever, ever hunt. But uh, yeah, I'm not mentioning that again. Yeah. Don't... <laughs> 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 um. So Nicole Beausoleil, which is a beautiful name, beautiful son is what it means. Uh, she is Madison Baldwin's mom, and uh, she was. She and Hannah St. Juliana's sister, I thought, were the two most powerful speakers. Uh, here's a piece of sound from Nicole Bo Soleil. Let's listen to this together. Those decisions that you made ultimately took my life, my daughter's life, because you decided that you didn't want to parent and listen to your son. You took the right away for me to be a mother. You do not get to decide that. You do not get those privileges. You are not above anyone. I love being a mom. It's the one thing that I'm truly great at. You cared more about your well-being than the one life that you should put above anyone, your child. And because of that, you took, that you both took four beautiful children away from this world. Being a parent is the best, is the part of life that you should hold to the highest level. It's an honor to be a mother or a father. Even when you think you have done your best, you continue to do more. Unfortunately, you, you never made it to level one. You say you wouldn't do anything different. Well, that really says on what type of parents you are, because there's a lot of things I would do different. But the one thing would, I would have wanted to be different was to take that bullet that day so she could continue to live the life she deserved. That is powerful stuff. That's Nicole Beausoleil, the mother of Madison Baldwin. Tim Jansen, um, 
That's your hard. reaction. That's the hardest thing you for any parent to go through. Uh, it's devastating to those family. She'll never. I mean, she's she's going to need counseling. She'll have a a law a, a a lost in her heart for the rest of her lives when you lose a child. Um, it, it's devastating. Um, and these parents did not need that. They didn't deserve it. No parent deserves it. Um, so was this conviction, was this prosecution warranted? Yes, absolutely. And if it stops one shooting, it's justified. Future shooting. And these parents failed it. You know what they say, You, if you drive a car, you have to take a test. But you don't have to take a test to be a parent. All you do is some natural act actions and you end up being a parent. And far too little do we require out of parents. Um, so that's my take on that. Yeah, we were, we were just doing the story about these two moms that went missing in Oklahoma. And it turns out that the baby daddy, the father of the one mother's children, um, in a court filing, his mother said, look, this guy just doesn't want to be a father. He doesn't want a parent. He's a drug addict, wants nothing to do with the kids. Um, and you just see, I, I just don't understand as the father of three. I know Tim has two daughters. Brother Council has six children. Um, how do you just, you know, that's, they've got to be at the <laughs> forefront, at the center of your life. And if they're not, it's like Tim says, maybe, maybe we do need um, some sort of test here to become a, a parent. This uh, um, Nicole Beausoleil went on and it was, it was def devastating to hear this part of it. These were parallels. I'm going to read this part uh, to brother council. She went on to say, while your son was hearing voices and asking for help. I was helping Madison pick out classes. When you were called to the school over his troubling drawing, I was planning an oil change for my daughter. When you were on the phone trying to figure out where the gun was, I was on the phone with her father trying to figure out where she was. When you texted, Ethan, don't do it. I was texting Madison. I love you. Please call mom. When you found out about the lives lost that day, I was still waiting for my daughter in the parking lot. When you got a chance to speak with your son, when you asked him why, I was waiting for the last bus that never came. While you were hiding, I was planning her funeral. I was forced to do the worst possible thing a parent could do. I was forced to say goodbye to my Madison. That just gave me chills reading that. Um, again, brother counsel to me, one of the most powerful victim impact statements, uh, did that get the attention of the judge in your opinion? Well, it certainly got the attention of the judge. It got attention of everybody. Um, I, I, if you don't believe in God, then I don't know how she would have the power to get through that statement. I mean, I just watching it, I, I wouldn't be, I couldn't say a word just watching her. I mean, I, I, I don't know how she got the strength and power and 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 the poet the poetic part of it, it's just so deep and it's i i just I, I don't know how those words came out of a mother's mouth uh at a sentencing and and the power that she showed and, and the, the courage to get up there and say is just mind-blowing so uh did it make an effect on the judge i'm sure it did um practically speaking like i said i think that she already had her mind set up but still you got to let the victims be heard and 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 make sure that Jennifer and, and James hear it from the victims' mouths. Uh, so um, it was important for it to happen, and it's it's an important part of this whole process. And some, I'm glad she had the the courage and, and power and strength to be able to actually get those words out, because I think most of us wouldn't be able to. So, uh, and Brother Council, who is a uh, religious man, bringing up a good point. Um, you know, I, I brought this up last time, but. Uh, in the Jewish religion, when a parent passes away, you say a prayer for 11 months, which I did. And uh, it's a daily struggle for me. I'll talk about this with Brother Council off, off, uh, offline, but uh, it's, it's um, you know, just to have that belief uh, that people are in a better place and things are going to be okay and that there is a, a, a God looking over you uh, certainly would help in a situation like this. So uh, I hope she has that faith because, um, like Tim said, this is going to be something that affects every part of her life. She's going to need um, that that counseling for sure. Um, Tim Jansen, um, as Frederick Morris Roosevelt Brown licks my ankle, um, because obviously the COE and my lovely kids don't listen, and uh, 
left me with the pup here. Um, that's okay. She's looking my ankle. Uh, the judge uh, turned her attention to Jennifer Crumbly, and she says, this is a direct quote from Cheryl Matthews presiding over this case and uh, who sentenced them today. She says, Mrs. Crumbly, you glorified the use and possession of these weapons. Your attitude toward your son and his behaviors was dispassionate and apathetic. Your response to school staff after a 12-minute meeting was, are we done here? The thoughts won't help me, your son said. Help me, help me. The meeting ended with the Crumblies returning to their jobs and promising to get their son help within 48 hours. Two hours later, this is not part of the quote, but two hours later, Tim, he fired the first shots, two hours after this meeting uh, in school. Um, if that doesn't kind of point to the abject failure on their part, I don't know what does, but I think the judge captured that portion of it pretty well right there. It sounds like this is a very experienced uh, judge. Her words were, were right on. She basically told her why she's being held responsible and why I'm sentencing you. And what she described is a complete failure, not as a parent, but as a human being, right? And that mother's letter, you can see the power and love all in that same letter to do that, to be able to write those words, to talk about her daughter, and then contrast the failure of this person who she believes is responsible or equally responsible. It's so powerful. And I think the judge, and I think he mentioned it earlier, this is experienced judge. She didn't scream at her. She gave her her opinion and order and sentencing and described what she failed to do. It's clearly going to be upheld, the sentencing. Um, I mean, these, these, these are tragic cases. And any time a parent loses a child, we all say that, right? Hmm. A child should never go before a parent. A parent would substitute their life for their child most times. Um, but when you lose a child, and you can lose it from a car accident, but when you lose it this way, knowing that it could have been prevented, knowing that someone else's selfishness and lack of, uh, of any kind of parenting skills caused the death of your child, she, they're going to need counseling for a long time. And religion is one of the base places you can find support. Um, and, I, and I feel for that family, and I feel for that woman that wrote that letter, because that had to be difficult to do that. And then to read it in court. You know, I said to the COE after this was over this morning, after this basically four hour marathon, and I said to her, look, that this could be any parent in America. Um, it's a wake up call of sorts. There's not much you can do. You got to let your kid out into the world. But um, sadly, this is a very violent country, any which way you slice it. And school shootings, I mean, when you go to my kid's school, and I'm, I'm happy but sad about it, it looks like a, uh, like a fortress, you know, there's guards and it's, uh, not a way a kid should have to go to school, but it is a reality today. Um, same thing with the synagogue where I had to go to, you know, say the prayer for my father. It looks like, um, like a military training camp when you first approach, I mean, there's guys with guns, mm -hmm. long guns. Uh, Miami is a big target for that. So it's, uh, I don't know what world we're living in, uh, but it is uh, a scary one and a scary one to bring kids into, but they're here. And, uh, Got to give them love and show them the right direction. Um, Abby Crossing here to Tim. How often uh, do judges truly change their minds based on statements made by either the victims or the convicted? Curious if Tim has ever seen that. Have you ever seen a judge change their mind, you know, midstream, so to speak? I have. I have seen that, and I've had judges step out and recess the sentencing, and they'll call the probation officer with him. And you kind of know something's the judges, something hit home with the judge because now they're going to change the guidelines or change the sentencing. And that's a good sign usually for a defense when the judge leaves uh, because the guidelines are set usually the judge. But I've seen it happen. I've seen the judge even say to the defense, um, I was going to give you this sentence, but based on the arguments of your counsel and your remorse and your comments, I'm going to do this is what I'm going to do. So it can make a difference. Um, usually not in the more serious cases, not in murder or life cases, but in cases where you have a defendant, maybe a first time offender, um, or a fraud case, um, 
I think in those kind of cases, it does. A lot of people chiming in. They love to see Brother Council um, and Tim Jansen, but they've been uh, checking out Brother Council's uh, YouTube channel and loving what they're seeing there. So kudos to you guys for uh, supporting my man, my man, brother. My yeah, man. well, I appreciate it. You know, I'm still uh, within my first year of starting the channel. And part of the reason why I started it was kind of of Tim's point that you see a lot of these trials and, and, and right now there's, there's always a trial going on on uh, being live streamed. And sometimes you just want to jump into the, the screen and start shaking that attorney. So at least this gives me a little bit of a, a way to talk about what I'm seeing and give suggestions or, uh, you know, uh, different strategies that maybe I would use. And that's a big reason why I started Cause you know, a lot, a lot of times you got these really big trials, they're highly publicized. And for some reason, some of the attorneys are just you're like, how does this all fit in? You know, like that these attorneys are actually trying this. So um, that was part of the reason. So that, you know, just to be able to vent myself and be able to, you know, help explain that this is not all, this is not, you know, how it should be done always, you know, all the time. So uh, um, that's part of the reason. But I appreciate it. It's been a lot of, it's been a fun journey and uh, we're hopefully to continue it. And I appreciate all the support. How, how often are you dropping episodes on YouTube? I try to do it. I try to do about two, three a week, um, you know, depending on what's going on and depending on, on what's being filed in the different cases. Um, but I try to keep it consistent so people won't forget about me. So I'm not doing it as often as usual. I still have a ways to go to get there, but you, know. uh, you, you don't want to be doing it at all, as often as me. Trust me. It'll, uh, it'll make you slightly insane. Um, and uh, look at this, look at this, Tim Jansen. When, when are, when are we, I want to get Tim a show on uh, surviving the survivor. That's my goal. Uh, Tim knows this a little bit, but uh, so I'm work. not doing a, a sh my own show, and I'm in the works of doing it. Going to be once a week, I think. There, there we go, Tim Jansen. Uh, if there's maybe, an audience, well, maybe we'll bring him over to uh, surviving the survivor. Tim, we'll talk. We'll talk about it with uh, Steve Cohen. Okay, uh, we'd love to have you here, and uh, you got a built-in audience, and. Uh, Everyone raves about your hair already. So why go elsewhere? Um, Karen <laughs> McDonald, she is the uh, Oakland County uh, prosecutor here. She said today, and this is a direct quote, don't look away. These were tragic and awful deaths, what these families have gone through, and it is preventable. It is preventable. That is my message. Um, and she went on to talk about remorse, Brother Counsel, and says, remorse does not sound like I feel really bad. I'm sure they do. Uh, what that looks like is we messed up. We should have done this and we didn't. And we're very sorry. And that has not happened. They come here today and they act like they are victims. Um, a harsh statement, one that had to be made by her. Uh, what about her eloquence or lack thereof in issuing that statement? Yeah, well, again, you know, um, I think that the uh one of the questions tim will appreciate this one of the last questions that the defense attorney asked jennifer when she was on the stand was are you a victim in this case oh my god and i mean how what's the right answer to that i mean you know are you trying to get sympathy from the you got four dead teenagers and now you're you're going to play victim and she I, I i'm hoping that they prepared for that you know, like I would assume every question was prepared for, but there's, you just trapped your own client on the stand and there's no right answer. And she's, and she tried to say, well, I'm not like a victim like those, but everything was taken away from me. So essentially you're, you are a victim, right? And uh, th that's where this whole victimhood came from. And that was just the wrong way to go about everything. So um, no matter how bad your life is, there's four teenagers dead and it's because of your son. So you don't play the victim card. And they did in, in, in a small way. You know, maybe the, maybe the attorney thought they're going to get some sympathy from the jury. I don't know. I spoke about it on my channel. I think it was a, a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, she does want to say that it's preventable. She does want to say that if you're just a good parent, none, none of this is going to happen. You don't have to worry about being prosecuted. That's, that's part of what she wants to say that this is just a really crazy case. And you know, if you, as long as you're a responsible parent, you don't have nothing to worry about. 
a couple more statements I want to get through, and then we will let these fine gentlemen go. Uh, keep in mind, brother counsel spent about four hours with me today. I told him if no. I was if I was being billed at his billable hour rate, I'd be in a lot of trouble. But uh, Victoria Powell here. I love Tim as well. Uh, Tim is awesome. Love it. I'll watch the show. Fantastic. Look at this. Bonnie Lee Lopez. She's going to get mad at me. She's your biggest <laughs> fan, I think, Tim. You and John John Singer, those are her uh those are her guys. And uh, um, only until he said he didn't like dogs. Yeah, oh, that's Remember true. Remember that? That's much worse than saying that you hunt birds, let me tell you. <laughs> um, there's no comparison. I don't think John Singer will ever be able to uh live that down. Side Barbie says Jen Jennifer and James are narcissists. Um and uh well, wow, thanks, Ned Smith. Joel, your hair looked really good last night. Thank you. Uh, wow. And Tim does have great hair. Here come the hair comments. You never know which way mm -hmm. these uh, conversations are going to pivot. So to me, uh, the most powerful speaker today was Raina St. Juliana. That is Hannah St. Juliana's older sister. Unfortunately, we do not have a sound of her. Um, but she said, and I'm quoting here about her younger sister, I never got to say goodbye. Anna was only 14. She took her last breath in a school she hadn't even been in for for three months. The fact is, as she looked at the Crumblies, you did fail as a parent, Jennifer, both of you. Instead of giving quality time, you gave him a gun. Your mistakes created our everlasting nightmare. They chose to stay quiet. They chose to ignore the warning signs. They continued to choose to blame everyone but themselves. Tim Jansen, when you go into uh, criminal defense attorney mode and you go into that, you know, how you're arguing, um, you know, th there's this is largely about storytelling. And this was as powerful a character as you can get. Uh, the not much older sister of a 14 year old girl saying this. Um, how does that impact um, everyone? Well, you never attack the victim's family. You never attack the victim. You know, you find other ways to make your arguments and points, talk about things that are not going to alienate the judge. Uh, these people lost their lives for no reason. The last thing, you know, those statements, you know, they're coming as a lawyer, you know, they're coming and, and it's not good. Um, and you have to show respect. You know, you have to show respect and you have trials. I've had trials where there are victims uh, even in date rape cases, you know, you see the parents and the whole family there. You have to show respect. Um, you're doing your job. And if you treat them with respect, they're not going to like you because you're doing your job. But they're, at least they're not going to hate you and they respect you for being courteous to them and showing respect. Um, and I, I've got a murder case now. And every time I go to court, the victim's families are in the court. And I had to walk by them and, you know, I, I, I said, excuse me. And they were very polite, but I knew who they were. And, um, you can do your job being professional, but you also can be respectful to the victims. Um, and I, I, I just don't think these lawyers did that. I don't think they were not disrespectful, but they had no client control. And I don't know if it was, they couldn't control them or maybe they don't have the experience to know how to control their clients. Because you you can get that you can get lawyers sometimes getting cases it's above their experience, uh, or they haven't had a case like this where they have impact statements of victims, and, and that's understandable. Uh, Ashley, by the way, reminding us all that um, Raina Saint Juliana she she did call out uh, one of the Crumblies for rolling their eyes while she was speaking. Um, Tim Jansen. If you ever saw your client who's about to be sentenced rolling their eyes, would you elbow them in the ribs? What would you do? I mean, this is uh, something that should not be done, and that is an understatement. Um, yes, and I had a client one time who, in federal court, got a not an unfair, unreasonable sentence and basically called the judge a racist. And this judge was a federal judge appointed by Barack Obama. And he's like the, the least, I mean, he's the most considerate, open-minded judge. And I grabbed him and I grabbed the family. I said, you need to stop. And I think the judge kind of heard it, but because I was afraid the judge was going to just double his sentence. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's really sometimes the family members in the, in the gallery say things.
that don't help your clients. You know, you can have that happening too. And you have little or no control over the family in the gallery because you're looking forward, you're concentrating. And I've had where family members are making faces at the witnesses and you got to deal with that. And you try to get your client to get the family to stop. Everything that can happen in a courtroom happens. And as much as you prepare, something's going to happen. Mm. Uh, by the way, I was just taking a screenshot of Lorna McKenzie saying John Singer got canceled. I just immediately sent that to him. That brought me a lot of joy uh, over <laughs> his not liking dogs. Who doesn't like dogs? Uh, I don't understand. Um, look at this. Leanne Maine has a dog right next to her head. Um, <laughs> I'm not embarrassed to admit that I sleep with dogs. Um, they're, 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 they're very relaxing creatures. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, a couple more things, and I promise we will begin to wrap. Lee and Maine, do you think they will open past school shooting cases now, Brother Counsel? I mean, is it something that they could do retroactively? It seems like that would be very tough. Yeah, I think it would be very tough, and I think there's also probably a statute of limitations issue. So uh, it would have to be looked into, but I, I, I doubt they're going to do that. It's... This is a this is maybe a precedent going forward, but they're not going to open up all those previous cases, I don't think. Mm. And look, I mean, people have very different opinions here. Donald says Michigan is evil uh, charging. It's going to the Supreme Court. I've seen that a lot, that Michigan is out of control uh, with their laws. People say that about Florida all the time. Um, we'll see where it ends up. Uh, Vicky, love all these new names again, but dogs are the best. I have to agree with you on that one. James Crumbly, in his orange jumpsuit and one hand still shackled to his waist, he got he got up, unlike Jennifer. This started off pretty well, I thought. Uh, I'm going to quote this. My heart is really broken for everyone involved. I understand my words are not going to bring any comfort. I understand that they are not going to relieve any pain. And quite frankly, they probably just don't believe me, speaking of the victim's parents. However, I really want the families of Madison Baldwin, Hanna St. Juliana, Tate Meir, and Justin Schilling to know how truly sorry I am and how devastated I was when I heard what happened to them. I have cried for you and the loss of your children more times than I can count. Um, but then it sort of took a turn where, uh, again, he was deflecting any blame. Uh, now that we've had a little time to reflect on this, Brother Counsel, uh, could he have done a better job in his uh, in his statements? Like I said, I think James did a better job than Jennifer for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but there certainly could have been more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you got to say you're sorry for it that it happened, and you know, you got to say a few basic thoughts. But absolutely, he could have explored that more. He could have said what, how much more he's thinking about it, and how you know what this does to him, and how he wished he could have done A, B, C, D, and he ate different. And, you know, of course he could have gone on and continued that way. Um, I think Jennifer was was worse. I think she should have done a lot more. Uh, James was probably the better of the two. But still, yeah, there's for sure room for him to have done a, a better job, I believe. So, And and here is Jennifer Crumbly, who did not stand. She sat and was uh, kind of shuffling through some handwritten notes. Uh, here she is. I was on the stand. I was asked if I would have done anything different. I was horrified to learn my answer I would not have was completely misunderstood. That answer is true because my, does, my son did seem so normal. I didn't have a reason to do anything different. This was not something I foresaw. That was the intention of my answer and how I interpreted the question. With the benefit of hindsight and information I have now, my answer would be drastically different. If I even thought my son would be capable of crimes like these, things would have absolutely been different. Even worse, when I learned during the police investigation that he had been planning a school shooting before November 30th. He was not the son I woke up, he was not the son I knew when I woke up on November 30th. The Ethan I knew was a good, quiet kid. He loved his pets, family vacations. My husband and I used to used to say we had the perfect kid. I would say far from that. Um, but Tim Jansen, uh, the point here is um, she previously said uh, that she would not have changed anything. Mm -hmm. And she was trying to backtrack on that today to say that she really didn't know 
how troubled her kid was. So she essentially doubled down. Right. I found that to be a huge mistake. What did you make of it? Can yeah, I just I, ask one more question before Tim answers? Sure, because sure, sure, please. I just wanted to tell Tim, also, one of the questions, aside from are you a victim in this case, is one of the questions at the end of her direct testimony with Jennifer was, would you have done anything different? And she answered no. And I thought, when I discussed this on my channel, I thought that that was also a very bad question to ask of Jennifer. It's it's a double-edged sword. How do you say, no, I, I, I did everything perfectly, but there's four dead teenagers. And then once you say, yeah, I did do things wrong, well, now you're kind of giving the case. So I, it was just another question that I know that you'd appreciate uh, uh, from this, uh, this attorney. It's kind of a question when you ask your client, are you still beating your wife, right? <laughs> it's no, there's no good answer. Nothing positive comes from it. And if you're ending your direct examination, you know cross is coming. You want to end on a good note, a powerful note. You don't want to claim you're the victim. Prosecutor probably ate her alive. And I just don't know if that if that lawyer is experienced enough that you would end your direct on those kind of questions. Um, it's clear she said he seemed normal. She's a horrible parent if she thought he was normal. I mean, the signs were, were screaming for attention. She was sent to the school because he drew a, I think it was a, a gun with a body, and then she, they bought him a gun, and she was too busy. She had to go back to work. Are we done here? And I think that would have been funny that the judge should have said, well, we're done here. You're going 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did not prepare her. And, and I take that back. They may not have been able to prepare her. It looked like she was reading that. I don't know if she wrote it or maybe the lawyer helped write it or someone wrote it. It didn't come off the cuff. Um, and it just wasn't positive, not productive. And she probably thought it doesn't matter what I say. They're going to sentence me. But it's poor optics. I yeah. tell Joel all the time that trials are nothing more than a play, right? It's a show. Each side prepares their play. You know, you make your presentation, you do as good as you can, and then you, in your closing, you try to end the show favorable so that jury finds your way. Everything you do, everything you say is looked at, considered by the jury, right? Uh, those questions were not, whoever produced that or wrote that would be fired in Hollywood, right? And it certainly would be fired in my, my, in my law firm. They wouldn't be doing another trial. Um, Martin? AKA brother counsel. He's got his own COE. He's got a hop right now. Martin, any uh, quick final thought before you get yelled at by your COE? All I can say is uh, it's been nothing but a pleasure to come on twice as a best guest on STS. I can't imagine a better day than this. I'm probably not going to sleep tonight. And when I'm up at three o'clock in the morning, I'll be texting you if your dog's still in your bed. Uh, I love it. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, just so everyone knows, it doesn't come completely free. I told uh, Martin that I will treat him to dinner when he's in Miami. So uh, he, he so will. He treated me to lunch in Miami. Yeah, it's on me. All right, it's I'm looking me. forward. Yeah, come on down. I right, say hello to your COE and your six kids. All Thank right. You. All right. Uh, and then there were two. Hey, uh, Joel, you, you need me tomorrow? Um, I might. I'm going to speak to Steve Cohen tomorrow. By the way, we are doing uh, Chad Daybell opening statements. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to need you. A, Oh, you know what? Yeah. Are you around during the day? I'm a, I'm available in the morning. Oh, you're the man. Let me, I'll text you right after this. So you like how we, uh, we're conducting business over the air, but Tim, I'll text you right after the show, after I put my little creatures to bed. Uh, okay. Look at this. Um, oh, wait, COE. Why do you, we need you, Tim? Uh, that's what the COE says. We need you. She's Tim. a smart Tim. lady. Yes, she is. She is. Uh, <laughs> she's not the only woman to ever say that. Keen, <laughs> Keen Lovic. I hope I'm saying it right. Hello, everyone. Love from Norway. Cannot sleep. 2 a.m. here. I love the STS channel. Listen to this, Tim Jansen. The max sentence in Norway is 21 years. That's life in prison. Imagine that. 21 years is the max, and that's life in prison? Like, if you if you commit murder, you get 21 years. That's it. That's the highest, you, the most you can get. Wow. I don't plan on committing crimes, but maybe I should move there uh, in case I ever do. Um, it's a, the, the last place you want to be is Florida. Um, what a, uh, I don't know. I've just run out, completely just run out of things. I wouldn't make your plans public on an airway. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll give you a little piece of advice. Tim Chance. <laughs> Tim Chance, look at this person's just in time here. Lori, Lori's the ride. Uh, so Tim did remind me, thankfully. Uh, now, look at this. Fred is trying to dig his way to China. Hey, show is completely devolved once again. Um, tomorrow, Chad Daybell opening statements. And it looks like uh, Tim Jansen will be with me by my side as we watch these opening statements. I'm going to uh, send him a link and we will have him on. So you're going to get that expert commentary. No one else doing that legal commentary during it's almost like play by play. If you watch the NCAA finals, by the way, Jersey basically won that tournament because uh, the coach Hurley is a uh, Jersey born. Fred, can you stop doing that? I'm podcasting. Fred, <laughs> you know your name. Stop doing that. Come here. Let me show you guys. What time to trial start tomorrow at nine. Uh, it, well, that's the thing, Tim. It's uh it's in Idaho, so we might be in trouble because I don't think it's starting till about eleven. Okay. Um, so but if you can do it, there's Fred Brown trying to dig his way to China. Um, as I was saying, tomorrow, uh Sebastian, uh, I'm sorry, tomorrow, Chad Daybell's opening statements. And uh yes, Fred is growing up. He's getting big here. Um, Fred is trying to conduct his own business. What a mug on this guy. There he is. He's got his little bow. There's the camera, right, Fred? Are you happy? You're on camera now. This guy's a, this guy's crazy. He makes Carm laugh. I've never much better looking than me, Wildfire. Trust me. He needs to meet Windsor. Yeah. Where is Windsor? He hasn't appeared Where is yet. Windsor? Come here, Windsor. Windsor, come see Fred. Come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. Uh, come people here. are letting me know that Dylan Rounds' remains have been found. I have got to be totally transparent. I have come not here, followed it at all, but you know, I've seen this comment. For those who have been, uh, but what I was saying tomorrow, uh, I will get uh, Tim on here to uh, do opening statements if he's able to at 11 a.m., which is when I believe court begins. And then 7 p.m. tomorrow night, we are doing a show. Oh, there he is. There hey, he Windsor. is. There's Windsor. He wants to know where that little Freddy is. Yeah. Fred, get over here. Where's my friend, Freddy? <laughs> Trying to uh, make a match as part of STS singles. Hold on. Let's see what Fred does when he sees. Windsor <laughs> podcast is off the rails. People listening in the car, like, what is going on? Look, um, look, they look up, they couldn't care less, they could not care less. Um, and then Thursday, I haven't said it enough times. Sebastian Rogers at 5 p.m. with the geo profiler, and then we're back with Phil and Scott on Friday. So, thank you all for being here. Tim Jansen, there's Windsor saying goodbye. Yep. Love having Tim Jansen, love you all. <laughs> SCS singles canine edition that is correct and uh look at this fred we love you how about that fred everyone loves you love you america love you tallahassee love you norway and uh keep the victims uh and their families in your thoughts as i say goodbye with fred going absolutely ballistic it is utter chaos here good night everyone